Um, so um, I am the president of the Canadian Scientific Interest Association, and I'm a professor of physics here at Trinity Western. Some of my students are here too in this class. Um, so uh, the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation and the Vancouver Area uh, are uh, association of Christians in the science and all across Canada. So we, we have events and lectures and periodicals on uh, science and Christianity. You can see there are some seats are on the front row right over here. For, uh, for <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good sort for the rain. I'm glad you guys all made it here through the rain and through the construction. I had a hard time finding the back door uh, myself. You can imagine how hard it was for us. Yeah. So, um, so the, we have a, the Canadian Scientific Affiliation along with the American Scientific Affiliation publishes a quarterly journal. This is a peer reviewed scholarly academic journal. Um, and, uh, you know, many, sometimes you'll find Trinity faculty articles and book reviews in here. The latest issue there is a book review by Matt Knight, Professor Sam Some of so you have them for, uh, for your doctoral spots. Um, and this past summer we had an annual conference or was in Hamilton this year. Um, next year it'll be uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, so maybe uh, some of you will be there. Um, I just also just want to mention that in October, October uh, there's a we have a membership drive. So the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation has a along with the ASA has having a membership drive in October. If anybody anyone who joins the association this uh, month gets a free copy of this book, Real Science and Real Faith. Um, the, the advantage for students is that students can even join for free. So the student memberships are totally free. Um, and uh, if you want to get the hard copy of the journal, then you have to pay $20 a year. Uh, but if you join a student member for free, you get the electronic copy of the journal uh, for free as well. For four years, you can be a free uh, student member of the CSCA. So I encourage you to sign up. It's easy to find uh, CSCA on the web and click the button how to join and so forth and do all that. And then we'll get a big box full of all those books and I'll hand them out from my office uh, when they arrive in November. Um, so you can follow uh, CSCA on Twitter. I'm on the new Twitter, and side Crip would be the Twitter uh, handle. And we're on Facebook as well. Um, and for tonight's event, uh, this being live stream, it seems to be an interest all over the world to hear this particular talk. And so um, our speaker has a Facebook page and a Twitter um, uh, Twitter account as well as a uh, blog. I'll tell you about that in a minute. And some people um, associated with uh, who follow those are watching tonight as well. And we're inviting uh, you folks uh, online as well as people here, I guess, to tweet your questions uh, in the QA to hashtag BakerTWU. So if you tweet the question that I I one touch and receive those tweets, then I'll ask the question and we'll have some questions. One question has already arrived. So um, now I just want to introduce our speakers. Well, thank you all for coming. Tonight's speaker is, is John Baker. Um, he is currently a graduate student, almost finished his PhD at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, working on uh, geo, uh, geology, geochemistry, and maybe he'll tell you a bit about his specialties there. Um, so he's from Utah. Uh, before that, he went to uh, the university, the C. Weaver University in, in Utah, uh, and uh, got his bachelor's degree there in in, in geology with a chemistry minor. Some of you are chemistry minors or majors as well. So geochemistry is really his part of his His master's was a few years ago. Uh, I won't read you his thesis title. His, his PhD is even more complicated than the title. But, as, but he's, a, he's an expert not only in geology, but also really uh, in, in theology and hermeneutics. He's uh, self-taught in biblical uh, theology, has had mentors in uh, and read it widely, and because of that, we he's able to, to engage uh, a lot of biblical uh, issues around topics like Genesis uh, as well. So, um, uh, one of the things that, uh, that that John does, and it's been a pleasure to get to meet uh, him and his, and his wife and uh, six-week-old daughter, who are uh, here present with me, um, uh, you can meet them too, perhaps, afterwards. Um, so, they, uh, we uh, I've been with them a few, uh, for a few days here recently. Um, he's got a blog, so one of his one of his uh, callings is to is to um, look at what how geology is perceived by uh, by the Christian community, and so uh, he's using his expertise to uh, help Christians understand what is the history of Europe from the scientific perspective, and how might that interact interface with Christian interpretations of Genesis.
Genesis, for example. And there are other organizations out there, and we'll hear about them a bit. And so um, you will often respond to Christian organizations which, which make comments about theology from, a, from an expert position. And so we've got a, a blog uh, called Age of Rocks, which I think I didn't ask you to sort of mention this, but it was on Rock of Ages, which is a famous uh, Christian name. Um, so ageofrocks.org is a blog, and also his Twitter handle. Um, so you can find him on um, Facebook as well. So um, I'm really, we're really glad to have you here, uh, uh, John, to tell us uh, a bit about your background in, in science and Christianity, science and faith, especially with, as regards to, to geology and thinking in particular about, about memory equations and your history of blogging in that, in that area. So let's give a great introduction to John. Um, Let me also just say before he starts that he's going to speak for around 50 to 60 minutes and then there will be a QA and a um, and we will be done here by, by 9 o'clock. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you all for being out here as we are so The turnout, especially in, in the rain, uh, this is my first time in Canada and so far I've really enjoyed it. Uh, there's a geology conference in Vancouver that I've part of. And got to spend a lot of time out here with Arnold and a couple folks uh, in Western. And so far, I've really enjoyed it. I, I think Vancouver is by far the uh, most amazing downtown that I've ever seen. So, um, yeah, it, it's a great place. And so, as Arnold mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate, and I'm, I'm in the last, I'm supposed to be in the last year, but the closer I get to the end of the PhD, the further out it gets. Uh, just, he's disappearing because I just think uh, anyways, I've been studying at UNLV, and my main interest is paleoclimatology, and specifically the climate history of Eurasia, uh, and, and I do field work in Russia. I'll, I'll, I won't really get into that, but I'll have a show you at least a sample from, from one of my sites. Anyways, uh, I, I do study there because my wife is Russian, and I have a great interest uh, personally in the region because I've lived there for a couple of years, and I was <clears throat> wonderful. Anyways, I, I guess... <laughs> so that's my one Canada joke. I won't think I've done it. If anybody, I think this movie was made before. <laughs> so I'm very excited though, to talk to you about a, a topic that's been very near to me for some 15, 16 years now. Uh, and a set of questions that really inspired me to ultimately live ultimately led me to begin a career in the earth sciences. Uh, questions like this, how old is the earth? And how do we know? And can we recover earth's past and tell its stories? And these questions have really intrigued philosophers and natural scientists and even theologians for millennia now. But it's only until the last century that we really converged, or all our efforts converged on a, set, a single set of satisfactory answers, which is this, 4.56 billion years. We know that by measuring the radio, relative radioactivity of so radioactive radiogenic uh, isotopes in certain minerals. And we can, with a wide variety of geological tools, in spectacular detail, tell the, uh, tell the stories of Earth's past. Or at least, uh, at least how that question might be answered if you ask uh, the academics and researchers. But if you pose that same set of questions to the general public, you might see some very different answers like this less than 10,000 years old. Uh, we know that by counting genealogical tables in the Bible. And yes, we can recover the past uh, because it was written down for us by someone who was there. Thank God. Uh, now, consider for a moment the scale of this discrepancy before you can get started. The accepted age of the Earth varies by six orders of magnitude, depending on who you ask. And I just want you to imagine, if you imagine in physics this, disagreed this way about something like the speed of light, or one set of physicists said it was 300 million meters per second, and another set of physicists say no, it's only about 300 meters per second. Now you should recognize right away that this dispute does not arise from a disagreement over how to interpret the scientific evidence. And as you can see, the respective methodologies by which we reach these answers have almost nothing in common. Uh, this phenomenon, which I believe is mainly a cultural movement, is commonly called young earth creationism. It is the belief that our cosmos and everything within was created less than 10,000 years ago, either in its present form approximately, and it was made only to appear old, or in a primordial form that was modified
died substantially by subsequent catastrophes. Uh, both views, in any case, are particularly strong in the United States. The recent polls indicate that more than one in three Americans accept younger creationism in one form or another. Uh, likewise, nearly half reject at least one major aspect of the theory of evolution, uh, especially common descent. And for Canadians, I believe the number is more like one in ten, but it's, it's, it's still there. And despite this, Earth and life sciences have progressed over the last decades, these numbers have really not changed appreciably, as you can see from 1982 to 2014. So it invites the question, which of these groups is terribly misinformed? And what is the root of their separate agreement? Disagreements, right? And that's the question that I want to explore in detail tonight. So I'm aware that some of you have held this view in the past, and maybe, I'm, I'm going to assume that maybe some of you still do today. And so I want to tell you up front, I'm going to be very clear. My intent is not to vilify or unlock creationism. And there's no shortage of online resources for that if you're looking for it. Uh, I don't care for that much. Uh, on the contrary, I want to elucidate how I came to love geology through the younger controversy. And I hope you will too. So, who am I? I was, uh, you know my name, but I was born in California. I grew up in Colorado. And my parents were both college educated uh, evangelicals. We attended church every day, and every Sunday that I attended school. Uh, they taught children Sunday school, and um, so that means from a very young age I learned the Bible, and it's all those stories pretty well, I really fell in love with them. Uh, in fact, as a child, I would often reenact Noah's flood in our bathtub by filling it up with the shower head. And I would watch every toy outside of the ark around in the flood that I just created. It's kind of exciting. <laughs> Anyways, my dad taught high school biology, and so I always had an interest in science. Um, when I was 10 years old, I wrote my first book. Sorry, so it was a, an illustrated encyclopedia about dinosaurs. It was kind of plagiarized in the books on our shelf. So I didn't try to publish it, but in any case, I tell you, I, I, I've always had an interest both in faith and science. But at age 14, my family moved to the last place on earth that I ever wanted to be uh, Utah. Uh, and actually, there's, there's really nothing wrong with Utah. It's a great place to live. It just wasn't Colorado, which is where all my friends lived. And so for a while, I really hated life. Uh, but I was kind of a nerd. And so I immediately found refuge on the internet. And that's where I stumbled onto pages that dealt with Christian apologetics and, and life. And everything changed for me. And I found one site that had articles about soteriology, for example, from the reform perspective. Uh, another site I learned how to read New Testament Greek. Uh, and, and during this time, that's what I did because I didn't want to make friends with anybody in school. Okay? <laughs> uh, anyways, during this time, uh, I was at a friend's house. Uh, my friend's family was homeschooled, and they had a really impressive library. And I was looking through that library, and I picked up the first book about geology that I would ever read. And I brought it for you. <laughs> a little bit of show and tell. So if you're interested, you can take a look. Uh, anyways, the name of it is Grand Canyon Monument to Catastrophe. I'll set it up here afterward if you want to just kind of come to the pages. Feel free to take a look. It was, it was written by uh, Dr. Steve Austin, uh, who at the time was associated with uh, Institute for Creation Research. It was published in 1995. Anyways, Dr. Austin argued, though, that the Grand Canyon did not be explained by, by conventional geology, and that the layers of rock that you see lining the walls of the canyon uh, were not deposited in ancient oceans and deserts over millions of years, but a river, and a river did not carve the canyon over millions of years. Instead, the Grand Canyon actually formed soon after uh, Noah's flood in a catastrophic recession of the residual waters. And that happened only 4,500 years ago. So that, that's a really intriguing hypothesis. But in any case, I was hooked because I had already become overconfident in my knowledge about the Bible and uh, the Christian faith. And simultaneously, I really like science. So how could I pass up an opportunity to understand or to see how modern science actually confirmed and supported the biblical stories that I love? Uh, some parents worry about their children drinking and smoking when they're teenagers. And I did that too. But this was my dangerous obsession, really. And it really defined the last uh, 16 years of my life. And along with the works of Dr. Steve Austin, I also read The Genesis Flood, which was written in 1961 by Lee Henry Morris on the left there and Dr. John C. Whitcomb. Uh, Morris is a hydrogeologist and Whitcomb is a theologian. 
So they, they wrote this book in 1961. It inspired the topic of a 10-page paper that I had to write in 11th grade for English class. And I argue that younger creationism should be given equal weight in public schools because, in my view, they had comparable scientific footing with other theories on human origins, gender, or history. And unfortunately, I received a C on that paper. Uh, but not because it was bad, rather because it was too good. My teacher refused to believe that I had written it myself and she wanted me to reveal the age of my, or reveal the names of my biology and siblings. I, and, and so I was really thorough on this. I, I really liked it. Uh, that means I was well known, actually, in, in high school for advancing what I deemed creation evangelism, uh, which means convince people that science actually supports the young earth and refutes evolution. I uh, use the weapon of the enemy against them. In other words, the way this book cover shows. Uh, and what's the only logical choice? I mean, if the, if the earth is only 10,000 years old or less, you can't use evolution to explain the diversity of life. Uh, you can't use geological evolution to, to explain how the solar system got here, how the earth and how everything else got here. Uh, so that, that's essentially how it works. Anyways, then I got to college in Utah. And it was time to declare a major quick after I got to college. Uh, but actually, I chose reality. Uh, you see, I had a great respect for Henry Morris, who founded the Institute for Creation Research. Uh, because for him, scientific creationism and flood geology, as it's called, were completely valid disciplines, but they were only rejected by academia because they lacked interest from qualified researchers. Like, no one, you know. It, Maybe if we just had a, a big school devoted to, to qualified geologists studying this, studying geology from a, a younger perspective, then it would be acceptable. <laughs> and so I wanted to be like him. I wanted to get myself a graduate degree and join ICR uh, in, in researching the scientific foundation for creation. I wanted to write books that elucidated uh, geology from a biblical starting point. And as I held on to this vision uh, through my first few courses in geology, but then my work got a little confusing. And after a few semesters, it was time to start my upper division courses. Uh, courses like this, I'm in ecology or structural geology, geochemistry. Uh, for the first time, this meant I would have to come face to face with the detailed evidences behind these fields. I, it wasn't just geology 101 anymore, I had to really get into the details. In the back of my mind, though, I remember the common mantra of scientific creationism, which is this. We all start with the same evidence, the same data, data sets, uh, but our starting assumptions, our very worldviews, really guide how we interpret the scientific facts, and that's why we come to such radically different conclusions. Now, I already knew how flood geologists and, and younger creationists interpreted the data, so I committed to playing devil's advocate. I wanted to see how well did the secular science fare, right? But farewell it did. <laughs> Uh, so I did farewell to the younger paradigm slowly. Uh, so how did this happen? Uh, first, in Sedimentology, we took a field trip to San Rafael Swell in, southern, in central Utah. And Terry, uh, this might be an expensive long trip, but if you are willing to make the drive, we have to look you around. Uh, it's a wonderful place to study geology and Sedimentology for kids. Anyways, on that field trip, I spent my time trying to envision how Noah's blood could have formed the, the vast layers of sand and silt and ice. Right, but there I was introduced to the Moen Hopi formation. Uh, all defined layers really defined the pattern, the pattern of yeah, At the base of the formation, uh, we saw numerous bands of ripples, very fine ripples like this, meaning that the sand was deposited in a rather calm environment, much like a, a modern tidal flat where the base is generally rolling. Uh, elsewhere, you see mud crabs like this. I mean, dozens of layers of mud crabs as you go up. And, and so this, somehow this mud dried out. And between those layers of mud crabs, you find green, uh, layers of green silt in clay, just like you would find today a, a, seasonally, a seasonally flooded plain, like in the African savanna. You've got a really wet season, you can deposit clay, and then a really dry season where cracks over it and fills in with dirt. Also, nearby, you can find outcrops like this at the bottom right. It might be hard to see for some of you. Uh, but in the bottom, you see there are very fine layers of sand and silt. This is very similar to what you find in a modern floodplain. But what, notice this very irregular body of homogeneous sandstone that's cutting through all these fine layers. What does that look like? Or what do you think that is? What is that? What, what made this sandstone? We 
have a fossilized river. And the river is encased in floodplain deposits. That's exactly what we find when we drill through modern river valleys. So what kind of global flood could result in such detailed art history? Now in paleontology, I learned that the creationist perception, uh, the representation of the, of the fossil record was very oversimplified. Because I thought it looked something like this, where you have relatively uncomplicated marine organisms at the bottom, and that uh, sort of transitions to more complicated reptiles, amphibians, birds, animals, uh, the, the large animals that have been defined in the recent past. But it wasn't quite like that. If you look in detail, but it turns out it's, it's a very detailed ordering of fossils. This is just one example of the ordination, very small period. And here we have, uh, these are trilobite species, individual species. But you have dozens of individual species, which all look very much the same. They can only be distinguished on a few small characteristics about the shape of their shells, right? Uh, so this is not something that water sorts out, but the fine ordering it occurs over large, vast regions. So this is going be uh, constructed in Argentina, but sometimes these species occur in the same order over the entire continent or even over the entire world. And then that's not at all what you would expect uh, in a global flood or any kind of catastrophe. Uh, I also thought that every fossil was, it, it looked something like that fish that was just out there because it had to be very rapidly, right? It was all the fossils were perfectly preserved almost. Uh, but that's not the case at all. Uh, in the summer of 2007, I actually got the chance to collect fossils in Bryce Canyon National Park it's in southern Utah. Uh, and that in, in this time, a single summer, we collected more than 11,000 fossils. So it's a, it's a large sample set, right? But out of those 11,000 fossils, not a single bone was intact with the rest of the skeleton. It was nothing like Jurassic Park, where you're pulling out a massive you know, monster after all intact. That's, that's not what the fossil record looks like. Instead, you have shards of weathered fragments, weathered, weathered remains, uh, things like rock trout teeth. Uh, these are just fragments of turtle shell and fish vertebrae. vertebrae. And here's a turtle shell. It wasn't found intact, but they, it was kind of all in the same tree. And that was the closest thing to an intact fossil that we ever found. The point is, these bones had to be laying out on a, on a floodplain, for example, uh, exposed to the elements long before they were ever buried and preserved. That's why you find things like heat that don't decay very fast. And you really don't find many ribs or leg bones because those, those get eaten or carried away. Like that. Uh, this is just something that was shared on my Russian Facebook recently, but it kind of gets to the point. How, what, why is the fossil record so well ordered? And here you have Noah saying to his son, who says, uh, now let's, let's bury everything that didn't die in the flood, that survived the flood. Of course, let's bury everything that didn't survive the flood. And don't forget the order. First, you have the Ediacaran fauna, then the trial bites, after that, the dinosaurs, and on very top of large mammals. And his son's objecting, he says, but Dad, this is going to take us millions of years. <laughs> 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 when I got to structural geology, however, I met my greatest challenge. I mean, younger geologists like John Baumgartner taught me that folds and faults were just uh, uh, the natural byproduct of what's called catastrophic plate tectonics. And you see, younger traditions generally accept that in the, in the past, uh, tectonic plates have moved around. Uh, for example, plates are moving away from Africa, creating this large oceanic basin between them, where North America and Uranus are moving apart from the planet. When they accept that this happened, generally, they just think it happened about a billion times faster than we observe today. Now, we could talk all night, actually, about the uh, what's called like, catastrophic plate tectonics and the physical absurdities that it creates. Uh, but I think there's a simpler reason to understand why bolts and faults didn't form during Noah's flood. Uh, first, one, we find brutal faults everywhere, and second, we find what are called syntectonic deposits. Uh, so imagine for a moment that you find that you have a flat layers uh, of rocks in this structure, and you compress them together. Now what's going to happen? They're going to ripple and enjoy, and, but eventually the rocks are going to break, right? And, and part of the rock will get pushed up, like you see here, uh, forming small hills or mountain ranges. And what happens when you raise rocks up in, in elevation? Uh, they get exposed to the elements and gravity. Uh, they weather into smaller rocks like boulders and pebbles and cobble. They get washed down the hill. And, and buried in, in layers of coarse grain deposits called conglomerates. Right? So, can these conglomerates tell us the, about the time processes that are going on as, as the earth is being deformed? Okay, we find an example of this in northern Utah, where 
Uh, all my examples are things that tell uh, in northern Utah, between the Utah and Wyoming border, uh, and during the Cretaceous period, these rocks were all compressed together and created what's called a cold thrust belt. Uh, so I want you to look at a cross section. This is like the cut the earth, like a slice of cake, and look at it to the side. This is either how the layers uh, look. Now, I want, you, I want you to notice a couple things. First, the sheer scale, which you probably can't read, but these layers in total are about 30,000 feet thick. That's more than 9,000 meters of sedimentary rock. Also notice how many times they've been crossed over on top of the underlying rocks to create a new mountain range, a new mountain range, a new mountain range on top of it. Right? Uh, so there's a lot going on just in this single picture. Uh, but there's more. Associated with each of these events, we should expect to find those syntec syntectonic deposits. Like every time you buckle the mountain, you know, buckle the layers and, and raise them up to a high elevation, you're going to expect to find boulders and cobbles being washed down into the, the, the adjacent valley, right? But that's, that's what we find. So you have a picture here of the Echo Canyon conglomerate. I want you to notice how the angle shifts. Can you see that angle of the layers, how it shifts? Yes, horizontal to more critical. But from the bottom to the top, the angle changes. Why is that? The uh, reason is we, uh, what this is recording is a compression of the fault. And so you know, the, the fault moves part of the rocks up. Uh, and the part of the flat layer of conglomerate. But then the fault moves, and so part of Part of the base and drops down, and then it deposits another flat layer on top of that. The base drops down, another flat layer on top of that. So it's recording in steps the progression of this fault happening and filling in the adjacent basin. But the most important thing I want to tell you: look at the boulders that are making up. Uh, you can see the size of these boulders. Where are the boulders? Where did they come from? And these are from the underlying rock layers, the Paleozoic uh, limestones and sandstones that were underneath this conglomerate. What that means. It's that those layers had to be completely solid, complete, turned into complete uh, stone before this conglomerate could have happened, before any of this folding and faulting could have ever taken place. Right? But if, if those layers were deposited in Noah's blood, on the other hand, <coughs> excuse me, if those were, layers were deposited in Noah's blood, then they would still be soft today. Uh, and, and there's no way that this, this sort of conglomerate could have formed at the same time as all these layers being folded and faulted. Okay, so what I discovered from structural geology is that creationists and older earthers, as they're called, do not simply interpret the same data according to their own worldview. Uh, conventional geologists interpret geologic data, but younger geologists really can't have to pretend that most of the data really exists in the first place. That was my sense. Uh, by the time I got to study geochemistry and geochronology, I had already recognized that the younger paradigm was in peril. Uh, this was unexpected to me because I was led to believe that radiometric dating was the principal reason for accepting an old earth. I mean, without it, we couldn't know if the geologic column were buried through one catastrophe in a single year or over millions of years from numerous catastrophes or slow crosses or anything else. Uh, but that was, that was quite wrong. In fact, there's a reason that even prior to the discovery of radioactivity, geologists have already concluded the earth was more than millions of years old. Uh, they recognize these processes take a long time. It takes a long time for rocks to accumulate and to then solidify into solid content and weather and all this, everything else. Uh, in any case, geochemistry brought its own set of challenges. For example, how do we explain the relative abundance of elements in the universe? Have you ever looked at this before? And this is just this tells you on a logarithmic scale, by the way, the relative abundance of hydrogen, helium, and so forth. Uh, so the question is, why is there so much hydrogen and helium in the universe? And so little bit in for the Zabora. Yeah, why are the uh, elements of an even atomic number about ten times more abundant than elements with an odd atomic number? I mean, this, this makes sense, uh, and it's easily answered from astrophysics, uh, where the elements are formed over millions of years in dense stars that combine lighter ones into heavier ones. Right? It's a process called nucleosynthesis, if you haven't gotten there in physics. Read about it. It's, it's quite intriguing and it explains why. It explains this graph very well, but it's not something you would predict uh, any younger than one. There's no reason to predict that uh, even elements are, should be more abundant than odd elements. Now, if we look at the uh, overall composition of our sun, of our Earth, and other planets in the solar system, uh, it turns out they're very similar to each other. Uh, and they're also similar to a particular set of meteorites called chondrites. And we, we've uh, theorize that this is it represents a primordial mass from which our solar system was, was all created. 
Uh, and this was a shocking coincidence, I thought, unless these solar bodies were all drawn from that same material. But there's no reason in a de facto creation for the Earth to be the same composition approximately as other planets or the sun or meteorites or anything like that. Because when we date these materials, like date those meteorites using radiometric methods, we all, all of them converge on a single answer, very, very single precise answer, about 4.56 billion years, and that's where we get the age of the Earth. Now, one could claim that this age is wrong. You, you can't say it's wrong. There is some uncertainty, and there are, unsub, there are a set of assumptions that go into radiometric dating. But what you can't say is that, a radio, that radiometric dating doesn't work, because otherwise, <laughs> these ages wouldn't overlap with such incredible precision. <clears throat> Uh, and radiometric dating works on shorter time scales as well. So here's a data sample which I've collected myself from Russia, uh, and we've got data here. So this is data with the, what's called the uranium chlorine disequilibrium, disequilibrium method, which relies on the fact that 234 uranium, so the ferrous and of uranium, decays in 234 thorium in the half life of 245,000 years. So we can date things very precisely that are a million years old or less. Anything that's made of calcite that formed out of water, like stalactites, corals, uh, and so forth. Anyways, notice how the age has increased from the youngest layers, right? This is the, the most recent layer in this slide. Right? It increases systematically from the top of the bottom, all the way down to 11,600 years. How yes. big is that? Uh, it's 35 centimeters tall. It's not a very tall one. And they all grow at different rates of the environment. But, um, but this method can date these very accurately. Some are quite young and some date to a few hundred thousand years old. I'm going to grab a drink. Sorry. <coughs> Academia 
and rejects young earth creationism from a distance, saying this is not legitimate. You're doing this because you don't know any better, right? You don't just take my class, pay the tuition, you get through it, and you'll understand. You'll, you'll figure out your errors. On the other hand, Answers in Genesis treats the general public as their peers. They share the evidence for free, and they give it a holy purpose. Now, as a theological son of the Reformation, I don't feel it necessary to explain which view I deem more superior, or sorry, be more appropriate or superior. Uh, so the question is, how does this work in practice? Well, there are six steps, in my opinion, that make the Genesis so successful. Uh, first thing is that they emphasize their credentials and those of the authors that they cite in a way that other scientists don't normally do. So here, just a sampling of creation scientists who either work for or for answers in Genesis, or they've written books and articles used by them. Uh, they give them public presentations and some conduct field trips. Uh, so they're really the primary voices today in, in, young, in the younger worldview. But what they all have in common are impressive credentials. They all hold graduate degrees from very prestigious universities, and you can't take that away from them. In other words, nobody can say that these men hold a younger worldview for lack of an education. It's not true. But if you read their writings, they frequently emphasize credentials in a way that most scientists don't. I mean, if you read an article in Nature or Science in the period of your publications, you're not told up front, you wouldn't know up front if the person writing the paper is a first year graduate student or a 30 year veteran of an international research team. Right? You don't know if they're male or female. And you certainly don't know what kind of religious beliefs that they, they hold. Right? So that forces you to judge the paper on the contents of what they've written. Uh, but here, uh, it's, it's probably not answers in Genesis' fault, but they do use it to their advantage. Uh, if you are a reader coming stumbling upon their website, you're really led to appeal to authority, which is an informal logical fallacy. Uh, now, we do this because we're human. And I'm not trying to pick, up on, pick on young earthers. It's our natural tendency to trust authorities whose fundamental beliefs closely match our own, right? But the thing is, it doesn't matter that 99% of the world's geologists, including Christians, disagree with these authors. Uh, because we don't, we dare not call them incompetent or dishonest. And it matters not whether we ourselves understand the evidence for an old earth because they do, and they reject it, right? So it's very easy to uh, transfer that decision to somebody else who, who's done the work, who has a legitimate degree. Number two, present the illusion of advancing research in a peer-reviewed setting. Now, creationists, the creationists are not banned from publishing their work in the scientific community. They can take part in professional meetings, and some authors like Stephen Austin have published articles that are good articles in geology, a very prestigious journal. A journal. <clears throat> but none of, their none of their arguments specifically for a young earth meet the standards of scientific publication. That leaves them with no choice but to create their own. And so we have here the Answers Research Journal, journal sponsored by Answers of Genesis, and Creation, Creation, Creation Research Science Quarterly. Creation Research uh, Society Quarterly, I think I didn't know. <laughs> But keep in mind, these are not peer-reviewed journals uh, for two reasons. For one, uh, young earth geologists are just too far, uh, far too few in number. There just aren't not enough peers available. I mean, if I want to publish a paper, for example, about the climate history of Alaska uh, during the last ice age, uh, I, to, to publish that article, I have to send it off to at least three reviewers who have devoted their entire career to studying nothing but climate in Alaska in the last ice age. And these are, I have to pass through several experts who may or may not agree with me about any part of my paper. Uh, secondly, these are not peer-reviewed journals because to submit to them, you have to ascribe to a very specific statement of faith. Now imagine I tried to publish an article convincing you that a meteorite killed off all the dinosaurs, but I submitted my article to a journal for people who believe that a meteorite killed off all the dinosaurs. They might not be very impressed. In any case, journals like this do vastly improve the credibility of creation scientists in the eyes of their readers. Next up, create a comprehensive article database dealing with any possible critiques from the outside world. Now, if you go to answersatgenesis.org and click answers at the top, uh, you'll find a vast collection of articles that deal with all kinds of topics that creation scientists offer their expert opinions on topics from paleontology to philosophy, even to politics. 
Okay. So someone here might say, well, how can the Earth be only 6,000 years? I mean, hasn't the rate of carbon method been used to date stuff that's up, up to 50,000 years old? I mean, it should be obvious, right? But there's an answer for that. Uh, here's an article by Dr. Andrew Snelly explaining that radiocarbon has been found in fossils and diamonds, which are supposed to be millions of years old. And therefore, radioactive dating actually support, or radiocarbon dating actually supports a young Earth. I mean, he argues that the amount of radiocarbon in the atmosphere was just lower prior to the flood. And so if you get an age of 50,000 years, well, it really means an age of four or 5,000 years, right? But what about those rock layers? And I talk about the brittle fractures and the conglomerates and stuff like that. What, what about that? Well, here's another article by Tom Tyrant and Snelly, telling us that the sedimentary, sedimentary rock layers could not have been folded into anticlines and synclines, anticlines and synclines, uh, unless they were still soft at the time. Right? So these rocks had to be laid down and folded very fast, otherwise they couldn't have been folded into these nice uh, tight layers, or tight folds. So what about ice floors? I mean, Maybe you maybe saw Bill Nye. He told us that 120,000 years of annual bands of ice, seasonal bands of ice, are found in Greenland and in Antarctica, right? Not according to Mike Ward, who reminds us that these dating methods are actually flawed because they're based on untestable assumptions and circular reasoning. He also argues that the ice could have accumulated in a matter of a couple hundred years uh, due to a, a contrast after the flood between really warm oceans and really cold continents. He said this would have created some very extreme winter storms, like uh, what day after tomorrow, <laughs> uh, extreme winter storms, so all the ice accumulated very rapidly. So he thinks he can explain that. Which brings me to step number four. Don't try to persuade the scientists because you won't. Uh, I feel rather to readers who will likely never follow up on the research. That's what they do. Uh, make the argument simple enough so that they, so that your readers can take part in the, the reasoning process, but avoid making firm, testable hypotheses that can be falsified by real data. Your scenario only needs to sound plausible. But most importantly, include both sides of the argument. So here, uh, I've got a bibliography uh, from Dr. Snelling's article, and you can see he cited some well-known textbooks at the top on ice geochemistry. chemistry. He also uh, cited an article down here by Taylor and Susan. Uh, where is it? Sorry, I realize it's not readable now on this screen. Anyways, he cited an article from a peer reviewed journal about using diamonds to measure background levels in mass spectrometers that, use, that we use to gauge stuff by reading carbon. Which is kind of strange. Uh, the title of that article is The Use of Natural Diamonds to Constrain Background Levels in AMS Radiocarbon Mass Spectrometry. Uh, what that means. Is that, uh, so how many of you know what a mass spectrometer is? It's a good number, right? Mass spectrometer, yeah, I'm, I'm very So mass spectrometers, you know, use magnets, and, and that's curves of different masses around the magnets, and depending on the shape of their path, right, that can tell you, for example, the, the ratio of heavy carbon or 14 carbon, which is the rate of activized O2 to light carbon. Right? And, and so we use these to date stuff by radiocarbon because using that ratio we can estimate an age. But the problem is, it's, I mean, it's an electrical instrument. It, it has to be plugged into the electrical source, which means there's always going to be some kind of interference. Right? Just like a, it, it, it's never perfect. And you also use vacuum tubes. When you send the, your sample through a vacuum, then, and then you can never reach a perfect vacuum in nature, right? So mass spectrometers always have some sort of background signal. And they're never perfect. Uh, and so they use natural diamonds to tell us, well, how much radiocarbon will we falsely detect in a sample that has no radiocarbon? Does that make sense? We put a diamond in there, it, and it gives us an age, for example, of 70,000 years. We know that we need to subtract that amount of radiocarbon if we're measuring something that's pure carbon uh, to calibrate the, the real age. So what Snelling did is he took this article and said, look, they're measuring real radiocarbon in diamonds. That means those diamonds cannot possibly be millions of years old. So it turns out we don't even need to read the and Snelling's article <coughs> there because he included it in his bibliography. But it matters very little because Snelling is not really trying to convince actual geologists with this article. So set number five, get notice by the world to be controversial. And if I Google how old is the earth, this is number three, what comes up on 
the answer to this. And that's actually the answer. Uh, we're also building a theme park centered around a life-size replica of Noah's Ark. Right? And, and they have a very impressive billboard campaign that gets a lot of attention. I mean, this is not going to drag atheists over the side of the road. We're going to log in and say, oh, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's meant to draw attention to them. Uh, and finally, make it about the gospel. I mean, in the eyes of answers in Genesis, this is really a debate over biblical authority. If you compromise on this idea, if you reject, if you accept the idea that the earth is actually old, you're rejecting biblical authority in some way. You're, you're compromising yourself on the gospel. And they will state that, you know, you can still be a Christian and accept things like the old earth, or you can accept maybe part of the theory of evolution, but you're not a real Christian. I mean, you're, you're compromised somehow. Your, your faith is at stake here. And they do this very effectively by saying, well, there's, here's creation, that's, that's one foundation, here's evolution. And so evolution, a theory in biology that describes how things work, how species develop and adapt and so forth. And so evolution were a fundamental philosophy, and really it's not. You, you should understand that right away. Evolution is an objective theory describing uh, life and, and its development. It is not a philosophy, it's not a prescriptive philosophy that tells us how to live, or how to think, or how we know things. Right? Uh, so it's not the case that if you believe Adam uh, existed and God created him, that now you have a set of, a hard set of laws, of moral laws, uh, and, and if you reject that, then suddenly you can do whatever you want. It just, it just doesn't work like that. Okay, so in 2008, I completed my bachelor's degree in geology, and I was already ready to begin graduate school in Las Vegas. I, a couple of friends were also moving off to el elsewhere in the country, and, and we decided, let's all start a personal blog, and we can keep in touch. And it was a great idea, except I'm really not that interesting. I'm quite boring a person. <laughs> I think only my wife will tell you about this. That's why I love her so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Anyways, I did blog about some personal experiences, but then it occurred to me, well, I've personally witnessed how these organizations, uh, appropriation ministries, misrepresent geology in various ways, and present those arguments to non-specialists, so why not write a counterpoint? And that's what I did. Uh, in early 2010, I wrote my first blog entry about young earth creationism. It was titled, Because Answers in Genesis, Emo, Fantastic, Argon, Rape, that day. It was very odd, I think, in many views. Uh, but that, that was the beginning. Anyways, so I devoted myself to the task uh, of writing about a new topic in geology about every week or, or so, and I would use articles and answers of Genesis as a starting point for my discussion. And so I decided to register a new name, a new domain, a blog spot, questioning answers of Genesis, a blog spot, and jump on. And I realized that the blog title sounds a little polemic, like I was just trying to start trouble, but for me it was autobiographical. And whereas I used to, originally I, I relied on ministries like this to understand science better. Uh, now I came to question the validity of their claims, all of them. So I blogged pretty consistently for about two years and took a break when I moved to Russia. Uh, but the point is, it was never really an internet sensation, but my audience did grow over time and it was really encouraging. I received a lot of positive messages. Uh, and then when I got back, I, I finally took it up again after I saw an announcement for a certain event. You can see here, between January of this previous year and February of the previous year, my audience basically tripled from one month to the next. Anybody know why? What happened in February of 2014? <laughs> so this really rekindled the public interest in young, younger creationism. And I wrote several articles about the debate. And I found a lot of new visitors to the site. And the traffic continued. So I thought, you know, I need to, let's, let's abandon the name, let's rebrand it, give my own first, a, a custom domain that's easier to navigate, and so that's how I come up with this. Uh, so this is, uh, Arnold mentioned, it's ageofrocks.org. And so I basically transferred all my old articles to the site and categorized them, made it so you can search through it. So, uh, and I started adding new articles there. And the best thing, though, is the structure page that allows me to I don't know, start to do something new and create it in the future. And my hope, for example, is to offer a comprehensive introduction to geology at some point uh, for people who just won't have the chance ever to take a bachelor's degree at just level courses in geology. Just 
and go back to college, you've already chosen it to major, that's not your thing, but you still want to understand more. Uh, so my hope is to have that online. Okay. In the course of blogging, I realized early on that I could not simply address topics in science, because it was really not the science alone that granted me an intellectually fulfilling alternative to the younger worldview. I mean, I had to write about, I needed to address uh, what the Bible did or did not say about her history. So this blog forced me to study scripture, and especially the book of Genesis, in a far more rigorous way than ever before. But when I, when I came to discover, and I mean this with the utmost sincerity, I found that younger creationism readings of scripture were as profound as the readings of the rock record. Which is to say, not very. <clears throat> in other words, their interpretations of the Bible, in my, in my opinion, were extremely oversimplified, but were ad hoc, and for lack of a better term, they were quite shallow. And just an example here, uh, here's an article about whether the serpent, when, when the serpent tempted Eve in the garden, was the serpent hanging in the tree, or was he on the ground? Here's another article about who was Cain's wife. Well, the article argues, as you probably know, that the Cain married his sister, and they had lots of babies, because, because back then, it was, it was fine to marry your sister and have big families, because today you weren't so impure. Right? It's me. It, it, I have to think, well, if that's the conclusion that you come to, like, if, you, if, you, if you begin uh, with the idea that Genesis should be read like a newspaper article, then you really can't go much deeper than that. So, to begin a meaningful conversation with younger creationism, I found that you ought to be able to show them what they're missing from the Bible, what their paradigm prevents them from ever seeing. And this usually won't happen on their own accord, because Answers to Genesis is saturated with caricatures of the most common alternative readings of, the, of Genesis, such as the analogical day, uh, the day H2, or the framework hypothesis, just a few examples. Uh, and they certainly won't ever address, they'll never address the view that I hold. Uh, and, and the point is, they really don't want you to appreciate or understand a lot of these alternative views that are out there. They're held by Christians from you know, all walks of life, from conservative to liberal, everything in between, from all sorts of denominations. <clears throat> but I think that the youngers reading a scripture, with, which can have actually falls very presumptuously, the biblical reading, uh, falls apart with the most basic literary analysis. So personally, I hold to what's called what might be termed a literary canonical reading of Genesis. Uh, that's because I believe that our most common mistake is to start with modern questions and impose our modern experience back onto the text. There is really no such thing as a plain reading of scripture or any other book. It, it's from Shakespeare as well. There's no such thing as a plain reading, as a common sense reading. Uh, because you're not reading the text, the text is reading you. It just tells us what your experiences are. Now too frequently, we expect Genesis to answer questions that the ancient Israelites couldn't care less about. So if we, be, if we begin with questions like, how old is he, or did mankind evolve from another species, we will inevitably misread the text and we will completely miss the point. And it will never fail. So the literary canonical view means that Genesis foremost is narrative, which is a form of literature, and not a journalistic record of events. And that means that it employs literary elements like symbolism and illusion and wordplay and drama to make its point. So you can't read it like an article from Associated Press. And that doesn't mean that Genesis is not history. It is history in a sense. Uh, but it's more so a prologue to history. A prologue to history, meaning that it informs us of the very nature of history. It tells about how God moves in history and where it's going, where he intends it to go. And that's why if you look closely at Genesis 1 through 3, you've read the entire Bible. Think about it. I mean, have you ever thought about it that way? It's no coincidence that Revelation ends with the scene that looks very much like the Garden of Eden. It's no coincidence that the Pentateuch, <clears throat> excuse me, the Pentateuch ends with the Israelites moving from, the, from Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt. And how did he do so? He divided the waters from the waters and brought them through. Right? And they re-entered the land, he said. Right, but you go sin against me, you're not going to go there. Moses is strong uh, your kin. So he says, Joshua, you will, you will enter it with those who do not yet know good or evil. And when Joshua cr 
crosses the river and they're about to march on Jericho, what does he see? Does he remember? He sees an angel holding a sword. Where's, where's the last time that we saw an angel holding a sword? He was at the Garden of Eden keeping people out. And here it is, the Israelites standing there ready to re-enter um, God's garden. So it's amazing how the story repeats itself over and over again throughout Scripture. It's no different in the Gospels, and I wish we had more time to talk about that. <clears throat> but we have here what's called poetic histori historiography. And that contrast with documentary historiography. We shouldn't expect the standards of history for the biblical authors to match up to our own expectations of what history is. Now, when we learn history, uh, it started with the Greeks, people like Herodotus, who made critical histories. They wanted to know the facts. Uh, they wanted to be critical of their sources. Right? We did the same, especially in the Enlightenment. We went back to the source and we criticized them. Uh, we were very interested in a, a detailed timeline of events, but that's not how most ancient peoples go history because there were things far more important to them than knowing exactly who, what, when, where, and why. Okay. We see this clearly though in the literary elements employed in Genesis 1. The universe begins, Tofu and Bofu. The, 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 the verse in English, the earth, be, the earth was formless and void. Did you know those words formless and void rhyme in the Hebrew? Uh, so it's no without form and without inhabitants. And then God systematically brings form and inhabitants every quarter uh, of the cosmos until all is orderly and functional. And he creates plants and animals of all kinds, not after their kind, but of all kinds. That's after their kind, somewhat of a misconception. <clears throat> he creates plants and animals of all kinds, meaning God brings, uh, brings diversity out of monotony, order from chaos. Diversity from monotony. Genesis also begins with an alliteration. Right? The, the very first verse, the alliteration, the alliteration, the But the point is, it, it begins with the alliteration. It's very repetitive, the whole thing is. It's much more like a hymn. It's not exactly poetry, but it's, it is semi-poetic, and that's not a coincidence, because the very first line actually echoes the opening line of the Babylonian hymns of creation. I'm sure you've heard this before. Babylonian hymn, the end of the age, is when, when high above heaven is not named to the earth beneath, it's not yet very named, the time we will absolutely get them in the chaos of month. The mother of the globe, their waters were mingled. Right? <clears throat> Uh, so the enemy English was written on seven tablets uh, much before the Genesis account reached its final form. It, but it chronicled Kamalarbu, the god of Babylon, uh, whose power was represented and symbolized by the king of Babylon. He came to power by conquering his rival deities, especially chaos. And it details how the creation of the heavens and earth, uh, you know, how, he, how he brought form, and, and he conquered the stars, and, and tried to put the stars in the sky as, as trophies. To commemorate his victory. But this was read every year in celebration of this fact and to exhort God, you know, our land is barren, recreate the earth for us so that we may live, you know, bring the waters and rivers back so we can grow crops and everything like that. But take a look at Genesis 1. The covenant God of Israel has no myth because he has no beginning and no end. Already at the head of time, rival gods don't really exist, they're, they're not there to stand in his way. But interestingly, Genesis does make a subtle reference to the Babylonian god of chaos. And look here, in the darkness is over the face of the deep. That Hebrew word for deep, they quote, is the wordplay for the Babylonian god of the god of chaos. Uh, so chaos is there, but it's not a rival god ready to, to battle the coming god of Israel. It's already subdued, it's aimless, it, it's, you know, it has no personality. It's just ready to submit to the will, the sovereign will uh, of Israel's god. Later in the chapter, we see the sun and the moon are actually the five of their proper names are called the lesser light and the greater light. Why? Because they're not deities for us to serve, for mankind to serve. On the contrary, they're set there to serve mankind. So Genesis, though, is written like a mythology. It echoes some well-known mythologies. It's almost completely been stripped of its mythological character. And in doing that, it actively subverts the cultures that are surrounding Israel at the time. And 
being repetitive and easy to memorize, it's a passage that can be read over and over again, or sung regularly among the congregations of Israel to remind them of the fact that theirs is a God who brings order from chaos, right? who brings diversity from monotony, abundance from nothingness, and life from not life. It means that there is a purpose in history. It moves systematically toward perfection. And so God may rest until mankind may truly reflect his glory. I did say nearly all its mythological character. There is some myth in Genesis. And myth, by the way, does not mean something that's false. Right? Myth is a means of exploring a profound truth by telling stories of the divine. And in Genesis 1, it is a story about Israel's God, and it does take place in a timeline because God creates the earth and the heavens over a period of six days, and rests on the seventh. Okay. And these are real days as we would envision, but what we experience all the time. So doesn't this mean that everything came into existence within a single week, within a single week in Earth history? No, of course not. Why not? Because this is the word week of the timeless God. The author could have chosen any period of time. He could have said six days, 360 days, a billion days. It really doesn't matter. I, there's actually some speculate that the author of Genesis, or one of the authors of Genesis, was a woman. And, and I think maybe we can say that the author of Genesis 1 was not a woman because that we might expect to see creation over nine months. I mean, it would, it would be meaningful, right? Uh, and and we, it's something that not all half of us can relate to. Uh, but the point is, the timeline is for rhetorical effect. Now, how do I know this? between each day, and there was evening and morning. It does not say there was morning and evening, as though there's summer, he's summarizing the day that this took place. So there's evening and then morning. What do we do from evening to morning? At least those of us that don't have a six-week-old baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a time for rest, where we regain our strength, so we can go on to the next working day and take it before we left off. But God doesn't need to rest Monday night, so he can keep working on Tuesday. This is obviously a literary image. So by describing God working over six days and resting on a seventh, the author has painted a portrait of God, which looks very much like our daily lives and the daily life of an ancient Israelite. Now we might be tempted to say, ah, well, this is an anthropomorphism, right? The author has brought God down to our level so that we can understand it. But it's not. It's, it's not an anthropomorphism. In making out God to look like us, to work like us, his portrait of God is not anthropomorphic. Instead, his portrait of Israel is theomorphic. You see the difference there? So Genesis 1 tells us that when we work for six days and rest on the Sabbath, when we keep the Sabbath holy, then thorns and thistles will not be the fruits of our labor, because we will be working with God toward that seventh day. So, I'm going to, I really should, yeah, I'm going a few minutes over, I'm sorry, but uh, we should at least ask ourselves, why does this even matter? What difference does it make if my neighbors and colleagues think differently about the tenets of geology? I mean, if we work in a skyscraper downtown, should we really care about the fact that the architect believes that Noah's blood is responsible for oil and gas resources? You know, if you're, if you're going in for a cancer screening, should you really care if the oncologist believes that mankind was created less than 6,000 years ago in its present form? The short answer is no. It is well established that younger creationists can be affected scientists, engineers, and doctors. That's true. There is something about this attitude uh, that allows large communities to reject key scientific theories, uh, which really should, it, it warrants some caution, some concern for the academic, for the researcher, and even for the Christian. Uh, for one, consider that these groups make up 30 to 50 percent of American voters and U.S. voters who collectively will decide how our governments will prioritize and fund education in the future. And before you say, well, that sounds like an American problem, so go back home and deal with it, <laughs> you may be right, but as long as the U.S. maintains the status that we enjoy right now in the world, this will ripple down throughout the global community. It already has. And currently, U.S. and Canada alike, we both import scientists and therefore we're able to export ideas and publications and technologies. But what happens if what, what happens if we devalue large sectors of our research community and just deny their credibility up front? What, what does that mean for the future of, of, of science? So along these 
slides, consider a few other trends in the public rejection of crucial scientific theories, namely global warming and the use of vaccines in, in uh, immunology. So these popular movements, uh, these, these have been termed, by the way, very pejoratively, science denialism. And that's a term I really don't like, and I don't think it's helpful. Uh, but the point is, it's not unique to questions about the age of the Earth that we've worked with twice. And a few research polls found that only six, in just last year, only 67% of Americans believe that the globe is warming, but there's solid evidence for that, and only 44% believe that humans are the primary cause. In 2012, around 6 to 10%, depending on which stage, 6 to 10% 10 of American parents requested a religious exemption from the hospital so that they didn't have to vaccine their child. And this is kind of what we're seeing already. We're already getting back to levels of quota vaccines for a great produce. Now, I want to be clear these skeptical groups don't necessarily overlap. And they don't stem from the same reasoning. I mean, many skeptics of global warming, like this guy, Christopher Longman, and Dr. Ian Plimmer, an Australian geologist, uh, these guys are not exactly religious. And in fact, Ian Plimmer in particular is a very outspoken anti creationist. But they are very much in favor of skepticism of global warming. You know, so is Dr. Jay Mott. He's a government creationist, also skeptical of global warming, so we kind of agree on that, but, but they would never agree with their geology or their biology. At the same time, Jay Wild was very critical of, of the anti vaccination movement, people like Bill Maher, who's a native distance the team goes. Right? So, so you, you have people from all sides on this. It doesn't mean that you're going to reject global warming because you're a creationist or, or reduce vaccine. Uh, but, but they all share a common strategy that is a bit familiar to you. If you go online and you start looking for the resources about global warming and about vaccines, you're going to find all of these steps covered. Okay, very last. Why should the Christian care about young earth creations? I mean, isn't isn't this just a, something that we can disagree about like any other doctrine? I would say there's, you know, up front, first of all, yes, we should be respectful of each other's views. Let's be respectful of the fact that there has always been a diversity of thought about creation for, for 2,000 years at least. Uh, but there are a couple reasons that we ought to be worried about the growth of young earth creations in the church. Number one, evangelicals are by far the most underrepresented religious group in the sciences. And they make up 23% of the general population, and only 17% of rank and final scientists are, uh, are evangelicals. Now, if you look down this list, you know, atheists are overrepresented in the sciences. Maybe that sounds spicy, but so are Jews. And you did lessons in the years of this. So it's not religion in itself that drives people away from science. It's particular attitudes among big communities that drives people away from science, and that's worrisome. And last, uh, younger creationism tends to, I think, drive people, especially young people, away from the church. So here's a 2011 Barnacle poll that 1,300 former churchgoers left the faith within a decade after high school. And it asked them, why specifically, why did you leave the church? The most popular reason, 35% of people said uh, that the church was antagonistic towards science. And 23% specifically mentioned that they were tired and worn out of the creation evolution debate. That's part of the reason that they left the church. Now, this only considers people leaving. And more than three, uh, more than three out of five Christian teenagers leave the church before age 30. And keep that in mind where you're at now. But if younger creationism is indeed misinformed, either scientifically or theologically, then we might necessarily place a massive stumbling block at the door of every church. It means people are tripping on the way out and they're never coming back in and or they're not getting in in the first place. And so I hope and pray that the next 50 years will not repeat the last. Uh, I mean, scientific creationism has been tried. It's given more than a, been given more than a fair hearing, I think. Uh, but I think it's time to move forward and meet new challenges that are already starting to threaten to cripple the church in the modern age. And with that, I'll uh, thank you again for being here. And I'm going to open it up uh, to any questions you might have. Yes, thanks very much, John. So we do have uh, about the 18 minutes for questions. I want to remind uh, people on the, who are watching on the live stuff stream if they want to hash, if you want to tweet your
question, do it by a hashtag Baker or TW, and I think we get your good questions. And again, uh, some of this may be sort of controversial to some of you, and so please uh, try to ask if you have a good question, uh, ask it uh, with respect, and we'll have a good conversation together. So, so uh, I'll let you do the question for that time. Yes. You say that uh, younger creationists are not interested in critiquing the literary canonical interpretation of scripture. Why? Why is that true? Why are they not interested in critiquing it? So maybe you could repeat the question. Yes. I was going to say, why, why are younger creationists not interested in critiquing what I, what I describe as a literary canonical reading of Genesis? Uh, I think they've gone through, they mainly focus on these alternative readings that started to appear in the early 1800s. Uh, and some of them, like the gap, what's called the gap theory. Uh, that arose by the sort of a geologist, the Scottish minister, who was trying to make sense of the rock record, right? And so he started with this modern question, and he gave a reading, a way for someone to reconcile the rock record in Genesis, but it, it wasn't very strong. I mean, it did, it did help people reconcile that, but move on with their faith and move on with their science. Uh, it was very strong, and, and so it's easier to critique. I think less easy to critique are are the views that are really buried in academia, but I mean, there are scholars who represent the majority of biblical scholars at, at the more prestigious universities who publish this in journals and such. Uh, they're not so much interested in critiquing that, I think, because it's a lot more profound, it's a lot more interesting, you get a lot more out of it. Uh, instead, they, most of what they write about are more or less strong arguments against uh, very you know, generally outdated views. <laughs> what would you say to Christians who argue that once you take out um, younger creationism, that's the entire big fault? That's the foundation of the case. I, I would ask, you know, where, where in scripture are we told that the foundation of faith has anything to do with the age of the earth? or how specifically God made the earth. Uh, the foundation of their faith was that God had called these people out of the wilderness and said, you know, follow me, be the salt and the light of the earth. Uh, here's what it means to attain to the divine image. Here's what it means to look uh, like the way mankind ought to look. Here's how to truly be human. And, uh, and that culminates, uh, it, it culminates in the gospel stories anyways, so the, the crucifixion the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, and that has to do with something that's innate to humans. It has nothing to do with what happened here before we got here. Uh, I, I think it's just not true because the basis of our faith, right, both in the majority of scripture, the basis of our faith in this particular God and, and how we think he works with humans, uh, it has, you know, it, it begins when humans are already on the scene. So we're already talking to God. It doesn't address what happened. I'll say one thing a lot of younger creations that are the like is the idea of suffering and death were all. So how do you say to that? Okay, so the question is what do you say to suffering and death before the fall? Um, I, I'd say first of all that this, is, this problem of theodicy, the, God, the, the question of why death and suffering can exist in our world, if God is there, is not, it doesn't go away if you're a younger creationist by any means. Uh, you still have to ask that question, and I really don't think it's a satisfactory question. I, I don't really think it's a satisfactory answer that's, you know, because a couple of humans in the beginning of time, uh, there is suffering throughout the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, and, and among humans in all kinds of horrible, awful ways. I mean, human, sorry, suffering and and evil things that are not innate to nature. Uh, they're, they're suffering, we call it suffering, we call it evil and immoral because, uh, because of what God says about how it ought to be. Uh, so I think it's better to, I mean, <laughs> there is no easy answer to that question, what do you say about suffering, but I think it's better to learn about who God is and by observing what we find in creation it gives us a better sense of what suffering, a better perspective of what suffering looks like. It gives us a better sense of uh, what a reconciled world at the end of time might look like. A sense of 
where we're going. Um, but yeah, it's not like you have a unique problem that stems if you, you know, animals die, for example, plants die before humans are on the scene in the city. You know, the, the suffering that we endure, part of that is natural, and part of it is because of the way we behave. And what you're referring to mainly is this natural suffering that's made through the world, and that's everyone has to deal with that. You know, Yes. I'm going to add a question. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the ICR Institute did some research on diamonds. And they found the C14 diamonds. The question that you can find them online uh, is that how come after millions of years you get C14 diamonds? Yeah, there are two things about that. So the question is about uh, saying that ICR had a study where they found radiocarbon in diamonds. And so how is there still radiocarbon if millions of years have passed since these diamonds formed? Uh, the first thing is, in diamonds, we shouldn't expect to find radiocarbon either in an older or in a younger, because those diamonds are far, formed deep in the mantle. Radiocarbon forms in the atmosphere. There's no way, there's no reason that we'd expect the, the radiocarbon to sink down into the earth and, and form inside of these diamonds. We shouldn't find it there either way. But we don't. That's the thing. I, yeah, that's, that's true. They do publish that in length, and, and I'm trying to write about this in length because well, they didn't actually do the study. They're citing other people who did measure diamonds in the, the A, what's called the AMS accelerator aspect comedy radiocarbon radio instruments. Uh, and if you look at those analyses, you'll find that so they, they took a single diamond and split it into six different shards, right? And they measured six different shards of the same diamond. And the age of this diamond was exactly the same between every face of the diamond. What was not the same, however, it is this, what's called the 13, that is a ratio of 13C to 12C. Uh, and if that was really radiocarbon in the diamond, we should expect the, the amount of radiocarbon to vary in proportion to the amount of 13 carbon. The difference is what the people of the carbon and life in this uh, that, you know, of course, you still find helium, so it's not possible. Yeah, here's the thing, well, with um, Russell Humphrey's study and, and Snelling's study, they took some data, the helium amount was measured back in the 80s and such. They took these data, they didn't run them again on modern equipment. So we'll have to, let's, let's assume though that those were accurate. Uh, there are two things to consider. First, they used a very oversimplified model for how helium escapes from third bond. Uh, so the question is here, we have zircon, it's a very, it's a, a very strong mineral, uh, and it contains a lot of uranium. When uranium decays to thorium and other elements, it releases helium. So over time, you should expect helium to build up inside this mineral uh, zircon. Uh, and the amount of helium that's there tells you how long it's been decaying radioactively. So it's another way to measure this. Uh, the other thing is, he, he claimed, or no, this creation scientist claimed, uh, that there was too little helium. I mean, I mean only 6,000 years worth of decay had passed, and so it was, it was proved positive that it's a zero that's gone through that much time. Uh, but what the, the thing is, they use a scientific model to describe how how helium builds up in a zircon. Think about it, helium is a gas, it's an inert gas, right? And so it doesn't bond to the mineral, it can't escape through little cracks, and we know that it does escape. There's a very complicated uh, scientific model that's used to describe how fast you should accept, expect it to escape over time. Now they use their own model, which assumed that the, the zircon was not shaped like an actual zircon shape, but it was, it was much more spherical. Right? So, uh, so they use this idealized model that really doesn't represent reality. But the question is, I mean, let's, let's, even if all of this analysis were accurate, when point is we measure helium in zircons all the time, and all of them contain lots of helium. The, the same amount of healing you'd expect after 20, 30, 40 million years or more. It's, it, so even if that one study showed that this particular zircon is only 6,000 years old, we have 1,000 studies that show 20, 30, 40, 50 million year old zircons from other parts of the world. So either the method works and the or the method doesn't work and neither, neither group can use it to support so I've got a question coming from Twitter. Um, does a non-young Earth 
creation understanding of Genesis days compromise importance of the Sabbath for Seventh-day Adventists, for example? Uh, I would say no. It, does, it doesn't. It doesn't compromise uh, the importance of the Sabbath uh, because the author in the, in the Pentateuch refers back to the six days of creation, so therefore make the Sabbath holy. Now it, it, it tells us in two places why we should observe the Sabbath. In one place, as it says, it points back to the fact that God made the earth uh, most of the six days. In the other section, it does not refer back to six days as justification for the Sabbath. Uh, so the point is. Uh, you know, this is just used as, a, as an example. It's used as a reference. And, and so, I think, especially when we understand that in observing the Sabbath, like I said, uh, we are creating the divine image. You know, we're becoming Christ-like when we observe the Sabbath, etc. Uh, that's really the, the significance. It's not the timeline itself that there were six days really in the earth district. That's not what makes the Sabbath important. Makes it important is that we recognize what we're doing on the Sabbath, what it means for God to rest, what it means for us to rest in God. There was one other question that I got. To, oh, one of you go ahead, Ben, and I'll give you another question from from the internet. Sure. I was just wondering if you if you had a, a lot of a contact and discussion back and forth with people from Anton Genesis or Creation Ministries. Uh, Question, have I had any contact or discussion with people from Answers to Genesis or Creation Ministries? Uh, a little bit. Toward the beginning, I had one author from Answers to Genesis uh, who, who was very nice. I, I criticized one of an article they wrote in a book and they published it online. Uh, he you know, didn't really offer any counter arguments, but we talked a bit and, and I kind of elaborated what I thought and uh, went back and forth. He, he was very kind in that way. But, um, it wasn't an ongoing discussion. He was you know, trying to prove me wrong and vice versa. It's very gentle. Other than that, um, I've, on a few pages, I've had some back and forth. I've tried to discuss the article that they wrote about, but it usually ends in, you know, it usually ends when they stop uh, approving my comments on the blog. And so I figured that's just fine. So the, do you remember the question that, uh, that Joel sent earlier? Do you remember that question? Yeah, so Can I rephrase the question and answer it? I, I, I think I got it. So he asked, uh, you know, what, would, what should I expect from my non-Christian colleagues about with the fact that I interact so strongly with younger creationists? How do I expect um, people who are not Christians to react to me spending all this time on this subject? Uh, the answer generally is, uh, I would expect most of them to look at this, like this blog or this spot or any of, any of those and say it's a huge waste of time. Like they're never going to change their minds, right? They're just deluded religiously, something like that. But it's, that's it. Uh, but I, I really don't think it's a waste of time. One, I know it's not a waste of time because I know how I've developed over my life. And I've had plenty of people write me through the blog and, and describe to me how they also came out of this view. They, were, they just never learned geology, period, uh, from a reliable source. And, and through this blog, I've actually been, made, been able to relearn earth science and come out comfortably on the other side instead of doing what a lot of people do when they, when they realize that the earth creation system doesn't match up to the evidence. They just leave the church entirely. And they abandon all their faith. Uh, and so I, I know plenty of people who have said, you know, I, this, this is very helpful. I, I managed to appreciate both science and faith. Uh, but it's also not a waste of time because, you know, like I said, it's not going anywhere fast. I mean, younger Christianism is very prevalent in the U.S. and many other countries, and it's not going to disappear. And as long as you keep complaining, which a lot of you do keep complaining about creationists uh, running for president, you know, running for senate, trying to pass an education bill in those states, why are you complaining if you refuse to address it? If you refuse to interact with younger Christians like human beings and respect them. And, and, and take the time to understand why they believe what they do so strongly. But if you don't, then the discussion goes nowhere. And it's one of the things that allows Christians to grow and grow and grow. The fact that non Christians have been so poisonous in their words. And I don't want to mention people like talking to me. And they made the talk worse. Thank you.
Well, let's thank uh, John once again. So I also just want to mention that if anybody wants to learn more about the Canadian Scientific Christian Affiliation, uh, the American Scientific Affiliation, I have some pamphlets up here. Uh, you can pick them up and remember if you're a student or anybody who wants to join, student membership is free online. And we have a month, uh, we've got a, a, a special book offer for one for the month of October for new members. So, all right, have a good evening. We'll see you next time. Oh, and here's this book that you can all uh, look through. Uh, uh,